Uh, all right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Moses Sampal, part of uh, Quantum Computing India team. Um, as you know, Quantum Computing India started off as a community for all things quantum, not just the tech, but uh, also pure science, uh, research. Um, even to some extent, we are now working on uh, you know, public policy side as well. Um, so as, uh, as a community, we are essentially trying to learn and unravel this whole technology that's completely uh, new, uh, so to speak, relatively speaking, it's uh, new. And uh, within Quantum Computing India, now we have uh, three streams under which we have put ourselves in and uh, uh, researching. So one is quantum cryptography, one is quantum finance, and the other is quantum machine learning. Um, so as a community, we uh, have events mostly during the weekends. So, so the Saturdays are essentially uh, what we call a facilitator series, wherein uh, people like Professor Cheyenne, professors uh, from RRI uh, and industry people from the likes of, uh, you know, the startups related to quantum cryptography in India. So we bring in people, so we try to learn from them. And Sundays are essentially the three verticals or the horizontals that we have currently within QCI. So our learning gets logged on Sundays. And uh, we meet every day between 10 to 11 as a team. Um, so quantum cryptography team meets from 10 to 10.30, so uh, the quantum machine learning from 9.45 to 10.15, uh, because everyone is working and uh, as a community, we try to hold each other accountable for each other's learning process as well, right? Uh, so these are two things that we do, which is facilitator series and uh, pure learning series. And apart from that, now uh, we're also slowly getting into a hackathon. So if you check out quantumcomputingindia.com, we have something called Quantum Winter where uh, we'll be partnering with uh, one of the most promising startups from India called Boson QSI, which is into uh, you know, computational fluid dynamics based simulations for the uh, aerospace industry. That's a very interesting uh, topic slash the area that these guys have chosen. So as a community now, what we're trying to do in November and December is uh, conduct a series of lectures around these multi-physics simulations, you know, like uh, computational fluid dynamics, computational heat transfer, uh, and these kind of like pure science uh, things will happen for the first five weeks and then like two weeks of hackathon. So you can check that out uh, on our site. We'll like put the link also here. Uh, now uh, with that as a quick intro to what we do as a community. Now uh, I'm gonna let Pradeep introduce Professor Shayan and the speakers and set the context for today's talk. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. So thanks, MSP. Uh, so uh, let me introduce our uh, speakers today. We have uh, Priya. Uh, Priya had uh, given us, uh, along with uh, Professor, uh, two weeks back, uh, she presented her paper. Priya uh, received her BE in Electronics and Communications yeah. Engineering from BMS College uh, of Engineering Bengaluru, and she worked a year in NI R&D Bangalore in RF team. She is currently pursuing her PhD at the Department of Electronic System Engineering from IIC. She has received the Vishweshwaraya PhD Fellowship from AT, uh, Government of India, and is currently the chair of IEEE -E -E IISC's uh, ComSoc student chapter. Her research interests include quantum error correction codes, fault tolerant quantum computation, quantum circuit architectures, quantum algorithms, and quantum communication. Welcome, uh, Priya. Uh, the second panelist uh, for our day today is uh, Dr. Ankur Rana. Ankur re received PhD and uh, ME from uh, IISC Department of Electronic System Engineering and Department of Electrical Communication Engineering, respectively. After receiving his B.Tech from National Institute of Technology, Kurukshetra, he worked for Ericsson Global Services Private Limited, Noida, for a year as a back office engineer. After his PhD, he moved to the University of Arizona, where he is currently pursuing research in quantum error correction. His research interests include classical and quantum information theory and coding, quantum algorithms, quantum cryptography, 
quantum optics fault tolerant quantum computation and quantum networks welcome ankur uh third on our uh, panel today is uh, dr mrityunjay guha majumdar he is a post doctoral fellow at uh, tata institute of fundamental research and a uh, research asso associate with professor brian josephen at cavendish laboratory he received his phd from the university of cambridge he has been a trinity barlow scholar nehru scholar tifr ni us fellow and inspire scholar and has had research experience in quantum information condensed matter physics and atomic molecular and optical physics he has presented india at international summits such as the first asian youth science summit in quantum information his research interest include resource theory network coding and measurement based quantum computation welcome ritun joy Okay. Uh next we have uh, on the panel is professor Arun Padakandla he holds a phd in electrical engineering and computer science a msc in mathematics both from the university of michigan at ann arbor prior to this he was awarded a masters in electrical communication engineering from the iisc bangalore and a be from visheshwarya technology university Following his doctoral studies, Arun worked in the role of a research scientist at Ericsson Research, Saint Joe's, where he contributed towards designing receiver modules for short-range radio used in IoT applications. In 2015, he was awarded a center-wide postdoctoral research fellowship by the NSF Center for Science of Information. From 2015 to 2018, he held his this fellowship and conducted research in the broad areas of information theory. and data analytics since 2018 he has been on the faculty of department of eecs university of tennessee <laughs> at knoxville his research findings include new results on certain long standing problems in network information theory that had resisted progress for over 3 decades his research interests lie in the broad areas of classical and quantum information science welcome on board uh, professor arun uh professor shah needs no introduction in uh, quantum computing india uh, community he has been with us for uh, almost a quarter plus now uh, he is looking forward of connecting with the community making uh, providing his uh, vital uh, guidance to us Professor received his PhD in uh, electrical and computer engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology Atlanta with a minor in mathematics MS in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Florida Gainesville and BE from Mysore University in electronics and communication engineering he held has held senior engineering position with Broadcom Corporation ST Microelectronics and Western Digital prior to joining iisc he was leading various research activities managing and directing research and external external university research program within western digital he was also the chair for signal processing for the idema astc and a co-chair for the overall technological committee at iisc he directs the physical nano memorial signal and information processing laboratory and he has been a research supervisor for seven phds and 14 masters student thus far he holds 14 us patents in the data storage area some of which are put into products professor garni is a senior member of the ieee osa the chair for the ieee data storage technical committee and the past chair 2015 2018 for the photonic detection group within the optical society of america in 2018 he received professor satish dhawan young engineer state award citing out outstanding contributions in the field of engineering sciences his current research interest include broad areas of theoretical and experimental works in physical data storage quantum information processing neural networks and learning systems and music signal processing intersecting with mathematics and physics outside academics he is a trained carnatic classical vocalist welcome professor shain thank you um... thank you pradeep thank you for the wonderful introduction sure so uh, 
to start with today's uh, uh, session what we are aiming at is to look at quantum information processing uh, what are the research happening globally uh, what is the perspective around it and look at a, a four course module uh, in coming months uh, to see get into the area of uh, research and uh, taking bring, bringing up a prototype or uh, working out on the quantum information wheel <coughs> over to you professor shain okay thanks very much uh, um, pradeep for this uh, nice introduction and um, today we are going to spend a little time pondering about um, research globally and and uh, you know uh, what are the interesting and important ingredients to um, you know start up scientific activities in this area sort of in, in a way that it can go towards uh, technology and eventually into uh, what we see as business and and these type of initiatives okay so i have with me uh, my team of uh, four other uh, members uh, two of uh, who are um, in my my own students priya and ankur and i have my uh, collaborators uh, arun and uh, mrithun joy so uh, so we will be giving uh, you a different uh, feel and flavor of all of these uh, in the sense um, a sort of a holistic approach from research teaching and everything that really needs to be done uh, that should basically uh, kick start activities of course uh, thinking locally within india in the context of quantum Uh, you know uh, activities in india that you know and and then also thinking globally because uh, whatever we do in science is not restricted uh, to one particular community or one particular region it is basically uh, for the benefit of the entire world so um, so with this uh, let me uh, briefly sort of introduce of course this is mainly uh, a sort of uh, i would say a very semi technical talk uh, giving perspectives and uh, so you will hear from me you will also hear from people that are postdocs uh, and also students essentially uh, that uh, that are in this area and and then uh, i think it will be good to get this perspective from from everybody to understand and know what's really happening okay so we can go on to the next uh, slide so let me um, briefly motivate um, my feel about this uh, can we switch to the next slide yeah great so quantum science and technology today is like what classical uh, you know communications or classical uh, information processing etc was possibly in the 1930s 1940s uh, this is this is my feel of the problem so it's uh, it's exactly it's analogous people then were thinking about having all these underground cables and stuff like that and pumping information or sending signals through underground telegraphic cables and all that you know very rudimentary elementary forms of communication uh, computing also was people had some ideas but again not really uh, had conceived in in the way you know computers have shaped the world that we live in today right uh, you know even the the turing's uh, this concept of uh, you know computer came uh, only during this uh, this is world war or you know this famous enigma uh, this decoder now uh, so we are at this at the stage and quantum has tremendous opportunities uh, to completely shape and completely twist and turn the 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 world that we are in today so i mean here's in the right side first let me just talk from science and and then i'll i'll get back into how the science really uh, gets back to society so we think about classical mechanics and stuff like that you know things are in the order of uh, you know really macroscopic world speeds uh, that that are uh, you know um, far less than the speed of light right you know uh, there's this is a cycle here the cycling speed indicates where we are you know from cycles this still macroscopic world from the bicycle invention to thinking about uh, you know two wheelers and and locomotives and dot 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 and aeroplanes and these super concords that go at really high speeds so there has been innovation all through this process you know there is 
towards higher speeds and also about scales you know from uh, astronomical scales thinking about these planets and other bodies and stuff like this you shrink 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 down people talked about these atoms and, and i remember when we learned uh, you know chemistry and you know, started off with chemistry or something as far as maybe you know in middle school um, we we had this picture about uh, you know this atom and, and then we knew that you have these elementary particles electrons protons and neutrons and stuff like this uh, and and then um, and then you know this is what we had this dalton's atomic theory and maybe if you spoke uh, to the senior generation or possibly now i'm hearing a lot of cross talk uh, someone i think has unmuted uh, i think so i request okay this seems fine now uh, the even like you know our grandparents generation you asked them what they learned in high school they would start with you know dalton's theory and stuff like this so and from there i think there's been a significant leap and 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 dimensions are shrinking you know from this microprocessor based technology we evolved uh, in, in in into this this pentiums and and these computers etc shrinking processes essentially right from 180 nanometers to uh, you know 90 then 60 then 45 dot 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 and now we are really uh, at at you know at, at very small and you know nanometer scales that we think about and people are now going beyond beyond and as you push these scales further you are going to boom in uh, boom hit into this uh, you know the the quantum regime right we are now talking about this wave particle uh, duality sort of where particles behave like waves or waves behave like uh, particles and that is that, that that led to the birth of this uh, uh, you know this this wave functions and 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 a new theory essentially that unfurled um, way back in the early part of the 20th uh, century right with 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 pioneers in this field uh, you know uh, einstein and schrodinger and all these people thinking about uh, uh, you know this quantum ideas and that was the physical world and now now we are thinking about really deeper science deeper technologies to enable uh, can we think about quantum computers that can replace today's computers that we that we have uh, you know with much smaller form factors can we enable quantum computers at room temperatures right people are talking about cryogenic technologies and you know this uh, super you know superconducting stuff can we can we enable those uh, at room temperatures is it possible and what about quantum internets when you think about communications so what is really happening in this quantum world is basically spooky action uh, at a distance which is basically harnessing uh, something which is very uh, central to quantum uh, physics which is entangled superposition and entanglement uh, this is the key harnessing entanglement is all that you would really need uh, to basically enable um, research and technology in 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 various areas so uh, there is also this physics perspective you know uh, various forms of physical you know quantum uh, quantum field theory quantum gauge theory etc etc quantum gravity and and you know people are thinking about these i'm not a physicist myself but i come from the electrical engineering and computer science sciences and then i understand uh, these implications from the physics world uh, what i see in, in the electrical engineering and computer science perspective so the the key challenges are as you go to smaller dimensions uh, you're going to get into the quantum regimes can and there's a lot of information and potential in the in the quantum world to be harnessed but there are problems as you know anything that we think there's an advantage always has a caveat and and the, the and the problem here is quantum systems are very fragile uh, they decohere very fast and it's not like uh, you know um, like our magnetic grains that we have uh, that you you know that 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 retain that flux within them it's not and they decohere very fast and within that you should be able to harness uh, whatever you want and there's a lot of power uh, in that so this is this is basically the birds i view of uh, of this um, this fascinating field and i have been following this field ever since my phd days possibly i was introduced uh, around 2004 or 2005 when i sat through graduate lectures in quantum information theory and uh, discussing this with uh, the instructor at the time john uh, cortis who is was john preskill's uh, student and uh, and and you know and then after that i was in the industry not never had time to ponder about uh, quantum and all that but things were ringing in my head about 
about these these outstanding problems and when i joined academia at isc you know all those things that were dormant uh, they they sprung up uh, in, into actions and uh, and of course there's a whole lot of uh, people working in these areas um, it, it it is a wonderful area at the intersection of physics electrical engineering and computer science materials and and many uh, many areas of course with firm uh, roots in uh, from mathematics okay now with that sort of introduction now where does this uh, you know when we think about science where does it uh, lead to right you know we think about uh, academic uh, institutions as um, a sort of like gurukuls or what do you call uh, gurukula or gurukul sivo oil in the modern modern context because uh, this is where something springs up you know the knowledge uh, springs up. not that it doesn't happen in industry a lot of excellent outstanding work happens in the industry there are plenty of examples but the academic freedom that you have uh, enables you you know without the business string attached to it you know in, in the sense of being driven uh, that that free uh, you know that 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 freeness that you have in academia basically um, lets you explore things that you may not um, you know it's it's a more free free thinking kind of thing so i i see this as basically synergy between um, academics and industry and let me see how this synergy works and then i will tell you how this helps in shaping the society that we uh, live in uh, and, and and then basically governance basically which ties all this so the core of anything is academic research uh, or industry even even before industrial research i would say academic research because this comes through some seed money from the government uh, possibly from the industry that you can see this uh, these ir arrows here industry could also fund academic research government could also fund academic research because government uh, money is again from the people you know in in most uh, democratic setups so um, now you have this uh, this money which is poured into academia and you know you nucleate the the, the right critical mass and you do this advanced research you know you explore the ideas and from 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 the knowledge that you have a priori you you basically build up research and research that you that you bring in uh, now becomes again teaching or knowledge for the future so it's basically like a push pull uh, engine right uh, you know you, you you start with some teaching some 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 facts and things that you know uh, through the coursework and then you begin research and you develop uh, you do this research and that research now becomes a body of knowledge that gets back into teaching so therefore you have these arrows between academic teaching and academic research and also these arrows connect from academic research and academic teaching into industrial r&d because you know people who get their phd's or postdocs or you know masters and you know undergraduate students that are trained from academic research they get absorbed by the industry they propel things further to make science enable into technology and products and similarly uh, you know academic teaching reflects back into industry because you have you know training programs and other things to basically get the industrial uh, folks uh, rise up to the to new challenges and fresh challenges which otherwise they may not have that kind of time uh, because uh, to invest because again it's driven by business right and they have to focus on their products and immediate needs or i would say 3 to 5 year of research for horizon whereas an academic uh, you can have a blue sky research that you can go on for like you know you can see the future 10 to 20 years and even beyond sometimes even 100 years <laughs> it sometimes you may, you may not the a researcher may not even see the the light a good example is galwa uh, you know this famous young uh, you know mathematician who who did who did his fundamental work in algebra and now if you think about hard disk drives or you know data storage devices flash memories etc etc including transmission channels they all work uh the the error correction error correction codes uh that are uh, in in these systems work from galois uh, theory you know and he never thought about what his uh, work would would lead to and that's that's the fun part about research and academy and of course industrial r&d they have their own ways in which they 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 do you know from getting from 80% if they want academic research will give you sometimes 80% all the way to 90% and once this research is mature at the level of 80% industry typically picks in and, and pitches in and then they want to get it 
to 99.999 and how many lines you want to add there to get the finished product which is useful for uh, the industry again it which that fueled back into academics back again and and again you know this is this is this is part of the uh, small uh, as, you know this is a society which basically and you know the economy uh, industry drives economy of the country and uh, the country progresses and and again the world progresses because it, it it provides employment opportunities for all so there is good governance and and you know a, a very efficient society uh, that you know that that uh, that springs up because of this economic development so it is all interconnected i mean you cannot say one system is away I mean, you cannot say that only academicians uh, have to be there are, are really the ones who do this job no it's not if if you wanted to have a hard disk drive it doesn't come from academic research <laughs> there's a whole lot of industry that really works to get this up and running and and i think uh, that's the central part i mean of course the ideas some central ideas come there come from academic research some some experiments theories and then that that is now uh, taken into industrial uh, research they advance it further get it towards products and then you know this whole cycle continues academic I mean, industry money goes into academia academia's knowledge gets back into industry through manpower or even through patents ips and uh, and many things so this is a very highly interconnected system you know it's uh, it, you cannot disassociate one with respect to the other so we need all of these things to work in tandem uh, if we were to see uh, from research to technology eventually to products so i think that gives you sort of a high level birds eye view uh, in, into in, into what um, into how we see things okay uh, we'll go to the next slide now where is this uh, whole field of quantum uh, stuff right it, the central part of it I, I you know this is my picture of the sun <laughs> followed by possibly you know they're not really like those different planets in different rings but uh, sort of like a, you know the different entities uh, on in the periphery of this hexagon so central would be these uh, quantum physical laws and experiments be it in optics or be it in you know superconducting conductivity or semiconductor conductors etc etc so the quantum physical laws and experiments and from there of course i i would say you have theories which 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 have to explain those experiments etc and sometimes you have to engineer those experiments based on what you have for which it requires in materials and stuff now from the basic physics and experiments you have quantum devices uh in in my in my uh, in my south uh, south um, southeast direction right the, this quantum devices uh, to start with um, you know how how can we enable single photon detectors for example or uh, sources that we that we could bring in or gates etc these type of things um, you know at, at very very fundamental device level i would say at the device level then we have com quantum computing algorithms hello uh, we have quantum computing algorithms and uh, these quantum computing algorithms uh, again you know harnessing the power of entanglement superposition all of these things algorithms that 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 are very efficient for example if you think about uh, computers you know for example rsa encryption it it, it depends on some some uh, notions of factorization etc some algorithms to do those right so you have to you know algorithms are very central to computing communications etc next i would see is quantum information processing so quantum information processing is everything to do with communications and information technology uh, you know things like error correction uh, quantum error correction uh, you know looking at quantum channels if you want to you know pump in more bits quantum bits through these channels how could we do that and how could we reconcile things like these uh, and quantum signal processing again this has implications in metrology sensing etc and it is also tied to uh, precision instrumentation and things right. next uh, is quantum circuits and systems uh, like we, we think about classical circuits and systems uh, right be it a simple transistor or collection of transistors to realize certain jobs like maybe amplifiers and things like this now we have to think about quantum circuits and systems in 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 in, in that way then uh, and the circuits and systems now envelop into quantum technologies and uh, and from technologies you would have quantum integrated systems you know 
large scale systems like we, like what we are seeing today as computing systems, communication systems, and uh, and and so on. So this is a really really uh, uh, highly interdisciplinary thing, and is not really one can say. Uh, of course, it it emanates from physics at the core, physics and even chemistry, I would say to some extent, because you know materials and stuff like that. You should have that knowledge that enables. Maybe I would put that slightly in the devices. But yeah, I think ma majorly physics centered and then uh, electrical engineering and computer science. And uh, of course, math is central to all of these. And then you have, you know, including from mechanical engineering at the at these scales um, to, you know, materials engineering and so on and so forth. You have a lot of very interesting areas uh, that, that cover this, this gamut, okay? So um, this gives you sort of a bird's uh, eye view of what uh, what uh, what the quantum uh, quantum world is like and what its manifestations are. Okay, so let's get to the next slide. Now, when we think about um, you know people in the industry like to think about you know verticals and horizontals. I mean, you know, this is this is your our way of representation, right? So uh, when you think about, like in this case, I have these row column structures. So along all the columns, I have uh, you know different areas like computing, communications, security is also some form of communications, but well, it, it can be like a hybrid between computing and communication. So I just leave it like this security. Precision instrumentation, right? This is another very interesting thing. You know, can maybe hitting of a single photon can it give a large, can we send something with a large change in resistance or something like that? And we've seen this type of, uh, uh, you know, this trans, uh, transducting effects in the classical side also, right? I mean, uh, you know, how we can measure uh, resistance as some change of something else, you know, change of temperature, you know, sort of how can we infer resistance, things like this. So now we are talking about really this very high uh, precise instrumentation and for which quantum mechanical effects play a role. And this is where this metrology sensing and all these uh, concepts uh, come through. Can we go in this direction? Of course, I just put this um, a, a sort of a horizontal roller indicating there could be many such, such verticals. When you think about horizontals, what enables all of these, uh, you know, what cuts, you know, what quantum uh, science and technology cuts across all these uh, these verticals. It could be photonics based, it could be superconductors based, it could be semiconductors based. You know, NV centers, dot dot dot, nitrogen vacancy centers, and diamond. So, for example, think about photonics. Uh, can we engineer a photonic based, uh, you know, quantum computer? For example, you know, photons, uh, non, you know, photonics is non-inertial. A lot of things you could accomplish, uh, but of course there are certain limitations in terms of your diffraction efficiency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in, in in the classical side, but going even to the uh, quantum side, there are plenty of challenges. For example, uh, to generate uh, these entangled pairs, for example, uh, we are not really very efficient. Uh, you know, Mrityanjoy I can tell later on. You know, we are you know 10 power 10 off. Uh, from where we start. So therefore, can we get those things back? So these are very fundamental questions uh, one has to really ask, even at the photonics level, how could we generate these uh, these bell pairs or what, what do you call these EPR pairs uh, that, that, that are the backbone for harnessing uh, quantum information. Then if you were to think about quantum computers and quantum communication interfaces. For example, we think about our normal computer. It's called video computing. There's also communication, right? With Wi-Fi and stuff like that. So if you were to enable such kind of things using completely within a quantum framework, you may need possibly superconducting technology at, at one side uh, along and then, you know, interfacing with uh, photonics and in the communication side. But again, there are you know, fundamental questions like, uh, can we do superconductivity at room temperature? Because there's a lot of uh, problems with, uh, with cryogenics and stuff like that. These are basic questions uh, which, which requires answers from science, which requires scientific investigation, all the way leading to technology. Semiconductor-based technology, you know, quantum dots and things like this. And one can also think about potential emergence of cross-disciplinary areas. Now, AI 
is a buzzword and you know, all sort of a mantra these days everybody wants to get into ai i'm not saying this is uh, new today because the birth of ai happened during uh, the dartmouth conference somewhere in the in the late 1950s i think 1956 or so uh, maybe um, a few years off here and there but that's where things happened and uh, a lot of th- uh, you know things evolved from there in the birth of neural networks uh, things like this and uh, it was not so in visibility uh, in in you know late 1990s etc but suddenly it has sprung up now you know ai 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 everybody talks about it artificial intelligence and 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 things now quantum is also one such kind of buzzword this this could have implications um uh, basically with the cross disciplinary areas uh, like uh, you know ai and quantum that are fused together right can you create a brain like type of thing working with uh, you know with quantum and uh, you know driven with ai these are some really really tough problems you know it's easier to ask you know pose them like that but actually solving those i think are really uh, the the key and needless to say clearly there is a very big business opportunity because anything that comes from science and you see that is uh, reproducible repeatable it, it 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 there is there is there's something that you could do you could harness uh, i think it could be put into products and and then you know this is how uh, the revolution starts and clearly i see this as a very big very big business opportunity driven from fundamental work uh, and that is uh, for the 21st century like what you think about classical computers who are something fundamental for the 20th century i think quantum computers quantum communication would be what it is for the 21st century of course working with ai and and all these things so i think this gives you a sort of a picture where the whole field is sort of evolving right and when i talk about communications i also mean storage and transmission because these are two faces of the same coin um, you know we call head or tail or whatever it is one side is the uh, you know the transmission channels and other is basically data storage and both of them are part of communications and you what you see at physical level communications if you go to higher levels of abstraction uh, it really becomes networked network communications and more at a systems level so it's it's really really interesting fascinating and i think uh, you know uh, some of us are just lucky to be doing these interesting things um, at this stage okay so let's go to the next slide okay so now um, coming back to you know from this high level perspective into teaching research and all this as i told you research gets back to teaching and teaching is required to start research right both of these are um, connected now how do we uh, you know bring in the community together and and you know and excite people to work in these areas so we have to start somewhere basically and this requires foundational courses so if you think about foundations uh, to quantum science and technology it's there are many verticals as i told many verticals many horizontals many many things but you have to start from fundamentals in each of these verticals and fundamentals from each of those horizontals and you find intersections where people work um, at 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 these um, at these you know at various crossroads right uh, so basically quantum mechanics and its evolution in various forms uh, you know f- from the physics side then again physics of uh, quantum sources quantum detectors uh, you know these process various processing elements gates circuits measurements uh, etc and as i told you across various verticals and even um, horizontally as well for example if you were to look at quantum communications you may want to look at all possibilities that you can think of and you need physics you need uh, math and of course mathematics basically mathematics is universal it's an art that you require uh, to gel everything together that gives the power of expression and then electrical engineering computer science and uh, you know dot 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 materials everything so then quantum algorithms and quantum information processing like thinking about quantum computing completely from a, a new paradigm perspective also post quantum you know things such as cryptography etc uh, you know quantum information theory quantum ecc's 
asking fundamental questions and designing codes um, with that work with channels, metrology, sensing, you know, this is basically like quantum signal processing. So these are all things that, that come into this field. And then system level perspectives, right? How do we write up, come up with a language for doing quantum uh, computing? Of course, you every, all, of, all of the languages in the language of, uh, you know, Hilbert, you know, you know uh, linear algebra and within Hilbert spaces, et cetera, operators and stuff like these. Now, how do we bring this to a simulators? You know, how do we simulate this? Can we build em a, you know, emulators possibly, you know, harnessing some rudimentary, you know, quantum systems? and all the way towards building uh, hardware subsystems and uh, technological you know uh, solutions to to grand problems that uh, that we face i think these are all very very uh, interesting things so basically the courses also have to be centered around this that go bottom up right you know like quantum mechanics one two three you will need foundations of quantum information processing one two three like at the undergraduate level, followed by how you would structure course at the graduate level, like quantum error correction coding one, quantum error correction coding two, quantum error correction coding three, dot, 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 at various levels. And this is how we need to basically evolve things, um, you know, from, you know, across all these horizontals and verticals. So, and as I told you, uh, eventually teaching and research contributes towards building skilled manpower. And this is useful to the country. And as I as I told you before, you have to think. Uh, you should act locally, but think uh, globally because science doesn't have any borders. Whatever we do, I think has an implication on the entire world. But I think we should uh, first begin with something which is local. That means we have to produce something tangible, right? That's very important. And because of this, uh, you know, this uh, this uh, this the scientific pursuits. Um, and leading to technology, it creates employment opportunities in frontier areas, and it improves the overall standard of the society that we live in. And that is what would be a big contribution because the common man at the end of today, if you think about the cell phone, they may not know about the touch screen, the, the capacity of transducer underneath or, you know, things like this, they may not know, but a common man uses these iPhones and for them, it's all connectivity and mobility and what whatsoever. I mean, that's what they see. And can we do something like this in the quantum world that basically shapes and, and basically, uh, you know, helps uh, the society. So these, these are the things which we have to think about it. And I have given you a sort of an eye view, a bird's eye view from the top down and, you know, one has to now think through bottom up and try to bring things um, all the way towards what we think uh, uh, needs to be done to enable um, science, technology, etc. Okay, so I think uh, I stop here and I would let some of my uh, co uh, friends take over and they will talk about certain research perspectives and some things about courses and things like this. And you're most welcome to uh, ask questions uh, and also you could even moderate uh, these questions and, and you can, um, I, I, I throw open the floor uh, to you folks. Okay, yeah. So, thanks, Professor. Uh, so, Let's discuss about what we have in uh, the quantum information science perspective, uh, the course that we are thinking, uh, what what comes in the module one. Sure. Um, Arun, would you want to, uh, you know, highlight those and then from there we can get into the science aspects and the, you know, the research aspects through uh, the rest. Yeah. Uh, you want me to take over or? Would like you to, to i would like you to take over and then basically okay. because we have dis and discussed this perspective with various modules and how you think this has to basically go ahead yeah yeah okay i'll give a very kind of um a brief uh high level perspective i mean uh yeah brief high level perspective um so i think there are a couple of things here so quantum seems to be uh, involving tools from multiple areas um like you have uh, you know on one side you have physics on on the other side you have computer science uh you have uh, kind of probability uh, very strongly sitting uh, at, at you know at the crux of all of this at the bottom of all of this uh you have uh, information science um 
this this forms forms the kind of the foundation of the uh, of of uh, of the theory. Uh, on top of that, you have applications. So you have computer science, um, you know, security, information science. All of this uh, kind of built on top of this. So, so to be able to leverage the um, uh, leverage the power of quantum, you need to have a decently good feel of many of these areas. And and one of the things that uh, one of the challenging things for most of us is when an, when a field is interdisciplinary, how do you you know learn what all that is required there to be an expert in the area and that you know that's essentially what academia should be doing but but again uh, we are we are at a stage where even we researchers are get, kind of getting trained right so so we are we are learning the things on uh, you know on our own so we are picking up things i mean I, i'm going to courses in operator algebra i'm going to courses in physics i mean go courses in so so what we should be doing is kind of providing a uh, you know, um, um, a, a course or a you know module or um, set of uh, learning tools that can enable somebody who's interested to learn all of these different areas in one course instead of having you uh, you know having you to figure out what you need and then go to those places. So that's really hard. So essentially, that's that's what that's kind of where uh, this whole thing is going. Okay, so can I request you to the, uh, get to the next slide? <laughs> Okay, so here I just give a very brief, uh, you know, introduction as to what quantum can do, what classical cannot do. So in classical, uh, one of the one of the challenges in classical is uh, distributed security. Um, so you have multiple parties, uh, you say three, four parties that are trying to communicate, share some data amongst themselves, but that data is private. Uh, and they don't want it to be, um, um, they don't want it to get to the larger crowd. Uh, but at the same time, the larger crowd is very much uh, conversant to their communication. So they, they are completely, um, uh, th their communication amongst themselves is uh, well heard to everybody else. So then you need the notion of a secret key, um, a private secret key. So these people, you know, have this private secret key and they are able to encrypt their messages and then communicate. Now, um, so the question is, how who gives you the secret key, right? And there's a very early result in uh, information theory that says that uh, generation of these secret keys is very uh, is it, it, it happens at very low rates, or you require a lot of resources for that. And these secret keys, see, you cannot keep the secret key static because once you keep the secret key static for some time, people will hack into it. So you have to keep it dynamic. But if you have to keep it dynamic and you still need people to agree on them, so you, you need the desired parties to agree on them and the parties that are you know adversaries to, to not be able to figure them out. So you need a dynamic update of the secret key. And it turns out information theory, we have, we have strong results in information theory saying that you cannot generate this, um, you know, uh, at rates that, that possibly we desire today and at the information exchange rates that are going on today. So, and then quantum here gives us uh, a new source of generating the secret key, uh, you know, without doing anything, it's kind of free, free, you know, it's a free lunch. So you, if you have multiple parties sharing what is called an entangled pair, they can actually uh, extract secret keys from these entangled pairs um, at, by, by just doing measurements. So they don't need anything. All that they need is this entangled pair. You need to have them. Um, and uh, each one performs a measurement locally observed uh, lo locally observed measurement they you know pick their measurement operators they they make the measurement and what they get out of it is random i mean they themselves don't know what they're going to get out of it and uh, what they can be certain is what i get out of it is what the other person whom i'm interested to communicate gets out of it so we have a secret key uh, and this is awesome uh, because you know it it, it completely uh, solves the problem of secret key generation, secret communication, and things like that. So this is just one. Uh, this is completely not available in the classical. Uh, such a thing is just not available if you don't tap into quantum resources. Uh, and you know, these entangled pairs have been separated at large distances. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's over thousand, two thousand kilometers. Um, uh, the Chinese have demonstrated it. They have done the. Um, so, so it's really now the industry that needs to take this over and kind of you know build the build the protocols to make this happen. And the question is, you know, you should have the expertise to be able to do it. Also, it turns out entangled pair can enhance communication. So, uh, on one side you're extracting secret keys, on the other side, if you want to communicate, 
and you share in you know entangled pair you can actually enhance the rate of communication so uh, so entanglement is a key um, you know key element of uh, quantum uh, just like superposition is so essentially to be able to uh, leverage this uh, power you need a solid foundational understanding of quantum uh, can we please go to the next slide <laughs> Okay, so as I said, um, kind of three offshoots, uh, not just this course, but of this understanding in general. Uh, quantum algorithms, you know, applications in computing, you've seen, uh, we, we'll be kind of talking of the Grover's algorithm, which, you know, which is, uh, helps you search. Um, there is the, you know, Shor's algorithm for factorization. So now the Shor's algorithm has, uh, you know, so essentially it says you can factorize, which means that you are, Current RSA um, security algorithms are indeed vulnerable. So you need to go on the direction where, uh, on one side, you might uh, you might want to think about how to prevent security leaks, uh, or you know use use the quant quantum computing power to to perform some computations. Uh, we are at a stage possibly where um, you can have you know, some centralized resource, quantum resources uh, for a country and, you know, something that's very complicated, you can get it done through that. Um, I mean, this, this uh, kind of goes back to the days of the 70s and the 60s where computers were there in, in the IITs and the IAC. There were a few computers. So if somebody wanted to get some computing operation done, they had to go and punch cards and get, get it done in those, uh, uh, in those computers. Actually, my father talks about it when um, he used to get these things done. So we seem to be in that kind of a scenario. So, um, uh, so that that so so quantum algorithms is one direction. Quantum error correction uh, is where you have. I mean, quantum error correction is almost like uh, you literally need it to survive in the sense that you can't do anything without error correction um, because even to just uh, read out the result of a computation, you need quantum error correction. So even if it's a completely you know um, clean computing task. Uh, to be able to even just read out the measurement, uh, read out your result correctly, you need quantum error correction. So you need to be top of in, on top of that, in, uh, you know, in some in some sense, those set of tools. And then is quantum information theory, where as I said, applications to secret key generation, communication, and all of this. So essentially, you need a solid foundational understanding um, of uh, several uh, ideas. You know, Hilbert spaces. Uh, some operator algebra, some uh, algorithms. Understand, you know, how do you define quant? What is quantum com complexity? You know, how do you compare quantum complexity to uh, computer complex? I mean, the classical complexity. Um, so you need to be able to understand all of this. Um, and so you know, you're possibly having a bachelor's in electrical communication engineering or electrical engineering, and you don't know what is complexity. How do I compare the algorithms? Or possibly you're a computer science person, you you don't know you know probability theory that well. So and probability theory, by the way, is kind of crucial because as I as we as we'll see, soon see, everything is through a measurement, and everything is probabilistic. So nothing in quantum is uh, you know uh, is deterministic. So so you can't do without probability, and uh, more than that, you have to do non-commutative probability. So. So essentially what we are looking at is to bring all the things that uh, we have painstakingly learned without you know, searching, searching out and learning things. Well, we have learned all this. We are trying to put all, the, all of them together in one package so that you can go pick it up um, and go in the direction you want. So essentially integrate what is needed in kind of one course in some sense um, is, um, is Kind of the high level feel I would uh, wish to say. Um, yeah, I I'll take questions at the end, but uh, would prefer for the next person to go ahead. Uh, I think it's Priya or whoever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so I'll be speaking about uh, my research uh, area that is quantum error correction codes. So let's first see why do we need quantum error correction codes and what they exactly are. So what happens is when quantum systems, like quantum computing systems or communication systems or storage systems, like when they interact with the environment, because environment is also quantum in nature, that is quantum decoherence, which takes place, which is basically like loss of coherence in the system. And when there is a loss of coherence, it's a, a quantum algorithms, quantum computing cannot be performed. Coherence is key for all these 
uh, quantum processes, quantum computing processes. Uh, hence, when quantum decoherence occurs, there's, there is quantum error or the loss of quantum information that we view basically as an error. And uh, hence, we cannot uh, compute or communicate or store uh, reliably as we would want to. And hence, we need quantum error correction codes. So that is uh, one way that quantum errors occur in the system. And the other way is by fa faulty quantum gates. So whatever gates that are used to implement these particular uh, uh, systems could be fa faulty themselves. And they could also introduce quantum errors. And that's why we need quantum error correction codes. So what are these quantum error correction codes exactly? It's basically like uh, we have quantum information which we need to process in the quantum computers or transmit in the quantum communication systems or store in the quantum storage devices. And uh, using these quantum error correction codes, we are going to uh, add redundancy to the information which we already have, such that even if we lose a bit of the information, because of the redundancy loss, we will still be able to obtain the information which we need. And that's how quantum error correction codes uh, work. And uh, basically, uh, the concept of error correction codes is not new in the classical systems like uh, classical communication systems and the classical storage devices, classical uh, error correction codes are widely used and they're also widely studied. So the next question is why do we really need classical error, uh, quantum error correction codes when we already have classical error correction codes? Well, basically it's because uh, uh, classical error correction codes, they take into um, uh, classical mechanics principles and quantum error correction codes are basically for quantum systems because classical error correction codes do not work based on the principles of quantum mechanics. So what are these uh, differences which uh, and why do we need the quantum error correction codes? So the first thing is that measurement destroys superposition. So as we know, like a qubit is a superposition of the zero basis state and the one basis state. And when we measure this particular qubit, the superposition which is there it is destroyed because the state collapses either to zero or one. So that's why we cannot use uh, classical error correction codes because uh, in certain decoding algorithms, uh, there are, uh, we'll have to know what exactly the value of the received, uh, uh, received bits are. While in quantum, we cannot do that because we cannot measure the code word because it will destroy the code word. And the next thing is other no-go theorems of quantum information theory, like the no cloning theorem, no broadcast theorem and various other theorems due to which we cannot copy the same state. So we cannot copy uh, the same uh, quantum information and parallelly process them. And the third one is that quantum errors are continuous. So like in the classical case, we just have bit flip errors, like zero is flipped to one, or if you have something in the higher dimensionality, it's just changed. Uh, it's just a simple change. But in the quantum case, uh, because errors are continuous, they basically belong to something called as the unitary group. So because of this continuity of, uh, con uh, because the errors are continuous, hence we have, uh, we cannot use the classical codes directly. We need something which deals with this continuous errors. And uh, we actually kind of digitize them uh, by uh, using some basis operators and stuff. But uh, even there, we have to deal with two types of errors. One is the bit flip error, which is very similar to the classical error correction code. But there's also one more type of error called as the phase errors because phases are involved out here. And we have to kind of correct the error, both of these errors simultaneously. And that's why we use classical error correction codes. So, um, but because of the similarity, uh, there is uh, the framework of codes which are basically used for quantum codes. They're very, uh, that's called as a stabilizer framework. It is analogous to the classical editor. There is some relation between the classical additive codes and the quantum codes that are built using the stabilizer framework, although it's not trivial, it is a, a non-trivial uh, pr process. So next I'll be speaking about like, what are the prerequisites that are required for one to pursue research or study about uh, quantum error correction codes. So the first thing is about the stabilizer framework. So all the known quantum error correction codes, they're constructed or based stabilizer framework. So for this particular framework, we need linear algebra basis, which is like common to everything in quantum, quantum dynamics and linear. We also need probability basis. Here we're speaking about uh, quantum error. So 
quantum information theory comes into play and we are building these codes for quantum channels let them be in quantum computers communication or storage channels and we have to look into the uh, we need to uh, we need to uh, we need to we need reliable uh, we need the we need to reliably correct the errors so that's why we need the probability basics uh, and we need quantum mechanics postulates because whenever we are building any circuit or whenever we are doing any processes or uh, building any theories we need to uh, abide by these uh, quantum mechanics postulates mm -hmm. we also need abstract algebra like finite fields groups and rings to build our codes we need quantum states in operators because at the end of the day that's what we are trying to uh, encode and uh, the pr basically the quantum states are basically the quant how we represent the quantum systems and operators is basically defining the processes that operate on these quantum systems and we need quantum information theory next is about constructing and the, the entire theory and the code properties of these codes which need the linear algebra basics we also need probability basics here and abstract algebra the, these are these two things basically need modules 1 and 2 of the course and the third is about the code construction algorithm the encoding and decoding and the error correction algorithms and also the circuit architectures about how we can go about building these once uh, using all the quantum technologies which various physicists are working on so we need linear algebra for that probability quantum mechanics postulate again abstract algebra quantum states and operators we also need a knowledge of quantum gates and circuits to know how do we actually go about building these circuits and uh, we need complexity analysis basics because we need to build the most efficient possible circuit uh, uh, for these and also order analysis of these uh, algorithms uh, so we need modules 1 2 and 3 of the course and the uh, module 4 is not directly related but uh, having a knowledge of all the quantum computing algorithms is very helpful for improve the, improving the efficiency of these algorithms because it gives an idea of how we can use superposition and entanglement to our benefit to improve the efficiency of the codes uh, so i would like to uh, request ankur to next take over from me thank you priya yeah so uh, you know there is this uh, growing um, interest in quantum networks because you know there are people who are working in different technologies right uh, some of them are working in superconducting qubits some of them are doing uh, you know quantum dots photonics so there is a in, you know large interest that how do we connect all these uh, technologies so that is where uh, quantum networks is going to come uh, in in the future where you know where we'll have a network uh, links between various uh, technologies in order to make sure that we have a large network and every node is doing some processing at their local uh, node uh, in terms of the technology that are that they're using so this will you know involve uh, long distance communication will involve quantum repeaters because uh, you know the information has to be communicated from one area to another area so there will be uh, these quantum repeaters and uh, we will have to use the knowledge of quantum error correction at those quantum repeaters so that information can be pumped forward and can be uh, used to connect different nodes in, in in a network and there is a lot of people a lot of researchers are working towards enabling or in, uh, you know uh, seeing the day or i mean the seeing the light for uh, quantum uh, internet so that is one exciting area which i am also per, you know uh, f closely following and how will this uh, you know happen in the future uh, can we go to the next slide uh, yeah so you know uh, as i said entanglement is one of the most important resources in uh, in quantum information uh, processing uh, so when we start with the bell pair uh, it's exciting because you know it's one of the application as uh, professor arun said was the creation of secret keys now this was what he shared was between only two parties now if this entanglement is shared between many parties many systems then it leads to very interesting scenarios and uh, you know some some of the phd work that uh, that was done was based on uh, entanglement share, sharing between various nodes and uh, there is something called a graph state and you know or graph states cluster states and there are so so many things that happen when uh, you know in 
from i mean the entanglement is shared between various uh, systems so some of the uh, models that exist for quantum computation is uh, this quantum gate error model which uh, which is basically a unit you if you want to perform a certain unit operation so in the quantum world uh, you inevitably are uh, you know going to do unitary transformation so this unitary transformation how do we enable so there are various ways in which these uh, unitary transformations can can be uh, created so one of them is the quantum gate error model so you have basically uh, a state and then you have some ancilla qubits so you you basically do some uh, connections between these and you propagate the information and in the end what you will have is a unitary acting on the initial state that you started with and uh, so these are all actually four there are four uh, currently what people have found is these four ways of performing uh, quantum computation measurement based quantum computation is basically again uh, it's sort of a distributed uh, uh, distribution of entanglement between various nodes so what they will do is there will be an initial resource state and then uh, you know people uh, they will do a measurement on various qubits and then the information will sort of propagate from one end to the other uh, end and in the end what you will have is a unitary operation performed on the initial qubit then there is this adi uh, adiabatic quantum computing which is based on quantum annealing uh, where a quantum computation is is like seen as a slow transformation uh, you know slow continuous transformation from an initial hamiltonian to the final final hamiltonian where the ground states contain the solution uh, there is this uh, uh, interest in topological quantum computing where uh it's based on braiding of anions and uh, so there is this famous paper by uh, uh alexi kitai so you can check this out uh we, this is and uh, you know as far as quantum error correction is concerned there is this uh, surface codes which are uh, widely researched upon and this is like uh, one of the very upcoming uh, fields uh, in in quantum error correction which is the surface codes based on the quant topological quantum computation so this is something uh, which is happening in the research at at various various places uh, can we go to the next slide yeah so you know wh why do we need quantum algorithms you know there is this uh, question uh, and uh, you know there were some some of the algorithms that that come is uh, you know we will share them uh, in the next slide so there is the speed up of pro problem solving is possible using parallel processing due to superposition principle for example you have in the classical what you would do is if there is a fu function that you and you are doing a computation you know what you will do is you'll play you'll uh, you know you'll input x and then you will get f of x right and so and you will build this entire table for every x you will get an f of x right so in quantum what is possible is the superposition principles so quantum states exist in a superposition of various uh, base states and if the function is if a function is uh, there which which computes these f of x for every possible x what you can do is all of this can be in a superposition so instead of doing in in a serial way where you will do one input and another uh, output followed by input followed by output and you will build this entire body uh, entire uh, you know this uh, circuitry what would what will happen is all of this is going to happen in parallel and that provides a speed up in solving some of the problems and there are uh, in the in the current literature what is happening is they want to speed up whatever classical uh, problems are there they want to find a quantum solution and if is there a possibility that you can uh, speed up uh, in terms of uh, you know comp computational complexity if you are using and there have there have been uh, solutions where there are exponential uh, the you know there is uh, exponential uh, advantage you know you you, are, you will reduce the uh, number of computations exponentially there and there are some of the solutions are where you are uh, using you are you are having polynomial advantages so this is very exciting uh, area uh, where, where one can pursue quantum algorithms to see some of the problems that are unsolved in classical world and there are some of the problems that can be speeded up using quantum computation and some of the principle some of the algorithms uh, are you can check it up you can learn it uh, some of the well known are uh, bernstein wasserani algorithm simons algorithm grover's algorithm josa doish algorithm and of course the web of famous shor's algorithm so you can check these uh, algorithms what they do what kind of problem statement is and how a quantum computer can be used to speed up these uh, 
these solutions. So the interesting part is like, can we use quantum algorithms for all problems? Can we just completely replace classical? I think uh, as far as my understanding is concerned, I would say no, like only certain problems which have a certain structure, uh, quantum computers uh, can use the structure and can efficiently uh, speed up the solution. So, and there's going to be a, uh, bridge, you know, there are certain problems which you can you you can use the classical computer for, and there are certain problems for which you will use the quantum computer. You have to go hand in hand, so you cannot get rid of one or the other. Uh, if you want to, if you want to see this future of computing, you will have to use both of them. And uh, the next slide. Uh, so, so for this, you know, like many students. Uh, they get scared, How? where should I pursue? What should I do? You know, actually you can start with simple linear algebra and the knowledge of Hilbert spaces, the basic probability and basis of quantum mechanics. Like I came from an information uh, electrical engineering uh, background. And when, when we, when I entered, uh, even I was like, how do I, how, I was scared. Like, how do I uh, enter into this area? So what one has to do is actually uh, a determined committed mind where you can just pursue whatever, uh, you can start with a, a Nielsen and Chuang book and you go with it and you enter the field, you you understand and what's happening in, uh, how is the concept being explained? What is, why are we doing a certain task? And uh, using simple, you know, uh, techniques like uh, of uh, these basic probability and Hilbert spaces, you can actually enter the field. And once you feel a little bit more confident, you can explore uh, other areas as well. So I think uh, it's an exciting field and we are all uh, geared up to see how this will see the future. Uh, thank you. Um, right, should I take over from here? Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining today. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be, uh, you know, in this uh, talk, which has looked at various aspects of uh, quantum information theory. Uh, today, I will be talking on quantum resource theories and hyper entanglement. Um, so probably I'm a, a slightly uh, the odd one out here because my background has been primarily physics all through. Um, and uh, I have been looking at uh, currently as a postdoc at TIFR, I'm looking at um, Meorana fermions and topological quantum computing systems, um, which are realized um, in, in, in certain physical platforms. Um, and I have also been looking at, um, you know, previously I've been looking at quantum information processing tasks, um, such as teleportation, quantum communication, and cryptography. Um, so here I would like to put forward what I see as uh, the primary kind of central element um, when it comes to the whole discussion on quantum information and entanglement, um, which is to do with the whole idea of resource, right? I mean, it's a very simple word. Um, um, the, you know, what is a resource? So when we're talking about quantum information processing, um, there are some tasks that need to be done. I mean, in terms of protocols, in terms of realization uh, of certain things, which I will be discussing. Um, and there are in, in physics, we have we have the idea of symmetries and constraints. Um, and given a certain symmetry and a certain constraint or a set of symmetries and constraints, um, one can have a useful physical resource, so to say, which one can utilize for various um, tasks. Um, so if, if I could go to the next slide, please. Um, right. So, I mean, what defines a resource, right? I mean, what is a resource? Um, a resource theory, uh, you know, for a given, um, um, you know, setting is basically character uh, categorization and characterization uh, of actions uh, in being either free or prohibited. Um, and the idea here is, um, I mean, if we go back to the, the early 20th century, um, um, this is a brief bit of a historical tidbit. Um, in 1894, Michelson, the famous Michelson Morley um, experiment uh, pioneer, um, said that physics, I mean, there's, it's, it's a longer quote, but he says that um, physics has been determined up to, uh, you know, only the fixation of certain decimal points or the fixing of certain decimal points. Um, and most of it is generally kind of known, right? Um, and obviously in a decade or so, there was a complete overhaul of physics. Um, and we had the Annus Mirabilis in 1905, where Einstein came forward with four seminal papers um, in various areas of physics. Um, now in, in that respect, um, even relativity for that matter, 
uh, put forward newer ideas of, of space time, for instance, uh, and the dynamics that can take place given that formalism. So for that, uh, for that in that area, that was the constraint and therefore thereby we, we could define dynamics with respect to the reset resource, so to say, uh, in that picture. Um, the basic idea for quantum resource theory is to study the information processing under a restricted set of physical operations. Um, I mean, one can look even beyond to look at uh, things like, for instance, channels um, and how they have uh, certain inherent constraints. Uh, people have spoken about decoherence as well previously. Um, so one can look at how to protect the resource from decoherence um, in what is uh, known as decoherence-free subspaces, for instance, uh, which has also been an area of interest for myself. Um, and, and so this is a very key point, which is to look at how um, we can have a resource theoretic outlook to the study of quantum system um, since uh, decoherence and other such processes can rapidly eliminate uh, the quantumness of the of the system um, and, and the most well-known theory of uh, quantum resource theory so to say uh, is that of entanglement um, there are other kinds of correlations there are ideas such as discord uh, which can also be looked at um, and so for two or more quantum systems entanglement can be characterized as a resource um, that when the allowed dynamics are a local um, quantum operations and classical communication which is LOCC um, what what I mean by that is um, that we have this constraint that if there are, let's say, many terminals in a quantum network, um, they can only locally apply certain operations to um, you know, um, perform some transformations, for instance, uh, and they have access to classical communication channels, which they can have access to as well. Um, so under those constraints, what is optimally the resource that is that goes beyond just that is what the entanglement picture brings to the fore. The entanglement is the resource that can be utilized such that uh, we can have various quantum information tasks, uh, which when supplemented with LOCC can give us very, um, you know, useful and optimal uh, processes and protocols that can be utilized. Um, so could I go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Right. I mean, so why are quantum resource theories important? Um, so there are a few, uh, four points rather. Um, so they obviously have a, a practical perspective. They provide a practical perspective uh, as to what are the quantum operations that reflect these experimental capabilities. Um, so if you have to perform certain kinds of, um, let's say, protocols, let's say an algorithm, um, one has to kind of, um, much like in when you, when, you, when you have to look at distances and how to kind of look at what are the distances between two points um, on, let's Let's say a sphere, um, or there is this whole idea of triangulation. Similar to that, one can have a subset of operations that can be together and cumulatively uh, that, that can give rise to a certain protocol or give rise to a certain application, so to say. Uh, so that is where the resource theoretic picture is very important. Um, and I mean, there is obviously characterization of entanglement, which is important. Um, for instance, one has this idea of distance measures. Um, so what one means by that is that one can uh, look at how a certain resource state is is um, optimal or not optimal uh, for a certain specific kind of application. So for instance, one can have things like cluster state quantum computation, uh, which don't quite have maximal entanglement. They have a, a certain, a very interesting uh, form of entanglement, which is um, you know, with respect to a certain operator, super operator, tensor product of certain operators. Uh, and that is the kind of entanglement resource we need for that kind of a measurement, uh, sorry, uh, application. Um, the second important thing is that this provides uh, the foundation to rigorously compare the amount of resource for a particular task. I mean, that is what is most important. Uh, and given certain um, system constraints, what can one get from there? Um, and it obviously em enables a fine grained analysis of what are the fundamental processes and properties that drive a certain phenomena. Uh, and uh, lastly, they identify the structures and applications that are common to the resource theories in general. Now, the major things which are, I mean, major resource theories that one has looked at uh, in the past, in the recent past, um, obviously one is to do with entanglement. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are things like, um, you know, LOCCs and uh, various other constraints one can put. And with respect to that, one can assess how useful a certain resource, for instance, is. Um, then there are quantum reference frames and asymmetry. Um, which has to look, uh, which which looks at things what are, which are known as fungible resources. Fungible means that which are convertible or changeable to some other resources, uh, and non-fungible resources. So one can have studies on that. Uh, there's a famous uh, work by Bartlett in 2007, which was on this. Uh, then there is quantum thermodynamics, which looks at uh, constraints with respect 
to energy and entropy, for instance, um, you know, free energy, functionally useful energy for that matter. Um, coherence, uh, again, going back to the discussion of decoherence and coherence, that's very important. Um, non-locality, non-Gaussianity, and uh, non-Markovianity, which is to do with order, how ordered or disordered a system is. Uh, there are certain things called Markovian kind of uh, dynamics, um, and, and you could have uh, things which are slightly more chaotic or, uh, you know, um, um, disordered, so to say. Um, and then there are quantum correlations, which are not entanglement, but the higher kind of, uh, you know, the, the bigger, broader family of correlations that are possible uh, in the non-classical quantum picture, so to say. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so now I'm, I, I was I have been working for the last uh, year or so on a very specific kind of uh, resource, basically, uh, which has to do with uh, entanglement across multiple degrees of freedom. Um, now, this is something which is known as hyper entanglement. Uh, and uh, this is um, so for, to give you an example, um, light, for instance, has multiple degrees of freedom, such as polarization, uh, orbital angular momentum, uh, path based degree of freedom as well. Uh, and it's very interesting that uh, for some certain kinds of um, uh, circuits or certain kinds of apparatus, uh, physically speaking, uh, one can selectively access or transform or do certain operations in each of these degrees of freedom such that they are kind of protected from each other. So you, you can have, let's say, a separable state for one of the degrees of freedom and an entangled one for another, or you could have multiple degrees of freedom across the various uh, you know, um, degrees of freedom. Uh, or you could also have a hybrid entanglement uh, where there is um, the, the entanglement is cutting across the degrees, so to say. So there are three cases. One is where you have separable, where it doesn't, like you could have one which is separate, uh, totally um, non-entangled, and in the other degree of freedom, you have a completely entangled state. Uh, you could also have a system where you have maximally entangled and maximally entangled or partially entangled states on both the degrees of freedom, or you could have one where both are interconnected and the entanglement is across the degrees of freedom, so to say. Um, and so this is a very promising resource in quantum information processing, particularly to do with optical systems, for instance, and that has been my area of focus. Um, uh, I have been working previously with uh, PRL laboratory, um, with um, uh, Shen and RP, Professor R.P. Singh as well. Um, and we have particularly looked at these things called uh, quantum hyperconditional gates. Um, so if you have a certain um, uh, subsystem uh, which has a certain state, depending on what that state is, what are, what are the things that one can do on the rest of the system, so to say, or the other subsystems, so to say, uh, across the degrees of freedom? So it's not only in, let's say, polarization or on vital angular momentum, but cutting across the degrees of freedom. Uh, that is what is known as the hyperconditional gates. And my area of focus has been on that. Um, so in terms of what can be covered and what I would like to cover in this front, uh, I think it has to do with general introduction to hyperentanglement, of course. Um, illustrative example with circuitry. I have not uh, shown circuit here per se, uh, apparatus. Uh, but there are things like um, nonlinear optical systems um, where you have uh, this thing called spontaneous parametric down conversion. Um, basically, it is a crystal. You have a crystal. You have a crystal, and uh, you can impinge pump photons uh, into the crystal. Uh, and what happens is that uh, you have emitted photons, uh, which are of a slightly lower energy, uh, but they have extremely interesting correlation patterns. So, for instance, in terms of momentum or in terms of you know polarization, there are very interesting patterns that can emerge. Uh, and this is one of the standard ways to um, actually, in actual laboratories, produce uh, entangled uh, particles like entangled photons. Um, so this has been our area of focus. Uh, but as Shen was mentioning previously, there is a loss factor which is extremely large. Uh, these nonlinear optical systems have almost 10 to the power 6 um, um, you know, in the SPDC case. Uh, and then there is another element called um, SHG, which also has a 10 to the power 4 loss factor. So there is a lot of optical gain uh, elements that need to be introduced in certain such um, you know, um, uh, experiments, so to say. Uh, and lastly, obviously, I would like to look at what has been my area of interest, which is hyperconditional gates and quantum information processing using this kind of a resource theory, so to say. Uh, next slide, please. Right. So, I mean, these two broad areas, which, uh, I mean, I've given a very brief idea about uh, what are the basic things which are prerequisites for both of them. Um, I mean, regardless of, uh, you know, which area of quantum physics and information processing you take, I think linear algebra basics and fundamental quantum mechanics are obviously very important. Uh, for quantum resource theory, quantum operators and information theory is important. Um, particularly entanglement characterization is important because one has to look at uh, the kinds of uh, constraints and the kind of applications that can be done. So particularly trace distance and norm-based measures are important 
important on that front. Um, in the mathematical picture, you have basic representation theory and group theory. Sorry. And, and tensor products and basic set theory and basic thermodynamics. Thermodynamics more because it's just an example of quantum resource theory. That's not as important, but the rest of it has uh, more to do with the mathematical foundation of what needs to be looked at. Uh, for hy hyper entanglement, uh, we have fundamental quantum mechanics again. Uh, but here, obviously, if one were to look at the illustrative example, one has to have a slight idea about uh, quantum optics. Um, and um, that is what I would like to explore, uh, you know, further if, 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 if I do look into this um, topic, uh, particularly looking at nonlinear optics and linear optical systems and how they can provide a, a hyper entangled or a hybrid entangled state, so to say. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mitinjoy. Thank uh, yeah, sure, Professor. Professor Shine. Okay, uh, so I think you people might have got a, gotten a, an idea about uh, this whole field, sort of a bird's eye view, I would say. So uh, this is really interdisciplinary, and um, and of course we would like to strengthen the basics from scratch, essentially starting with uh, basic math, basic uh, you know, um, basic in the sense basics of linear algebra, probability, uh, foundations into quantum mechanics, complexity, etc. That would be sort of module one. Uh, then module two would be uh, on quantum uh, states, operators, and some of these notions there, locality, non-locality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, module three would be into circuits, um, and, and gates and circuits. Module four would be into algorithms and stuff. So it would have a, a melange of all of these uh, topics, but one feeding into the other. And I expect all of these would be couched within a 30 hour uh, module, something like uh, NPTEL. And, um, but of course it, it would be modular 10. If you can, we could, we, we, we could even have a 10 hour module uh, you know, modules of 10, 10 hours. And uh, this could just, uh, you know, finally one could do a 30 hour um, a module, which comprise of, uh, of which comprise of all these, uh, comprising of uh, these, these, uh, these modules one, two and three and so on, 10, 10 hour modules. So uh, this is the, uh, the intent. And uh, this, you know, it would be online um, and, uh, you know, you would have videos, lecture notes and, uh, you know, resources uh, that people can access. And what I would, uh, I mean, of course, we would also uh, gauge your prerequisites before you're ready to take this or not. I mean, if somebody is really behind linear algebra or something, uh, or, you know, basic math, then I think uh, you may want to basically strengthen those aspects and, and take this course. So I think we would do our uh, homework, like the way we have done in PTEL courses successfully in the past. So uh, this is how it would evolve. And um, of course, it's a new field, new area. Uh, there is always some uncertainty when somebody wants to register to a course, etc. But uh, be rest assured, uh, you know, you will find this journey fascinating and interesting. And, and uh, you would not be afraid at the end of it. So uh, this is what I would like to um, uh, mention here. But I think this is very important because without the know-how, uh, it's difficult to do any research um, or possibly, uh, you know, you'll have to, you know, basically learn, self-learn and do things. Uh, and here, I think we will be able to put everything together uh, into a perspective and, and provide the right direction for people to basically uh, pick up on things and, and go further uh, deep into, uh, in, into the tasks that they're interested in. Okay, so with this, I will uh, leave the floor open for questions and answers and you know, discussions. So um, all of us would be here and I, you know, and we can, we can take, uh, take up questions. Sure, Professor. So uh, we have received a couple of questions in the chat box, which uh, I was picking it up and uh, uh, I will pick up one question, which is there is a class of intellect according to the quantum computers can never replace classical computers because in reality, quantum algos are much slower than classical algos. What are your views on quantum computer taking on classical computers? Um, I mean, I'm sort of uh, <clears throat> puzzled with the second part. That is, uh, you know, the quantum computers are slower than classical computers. Well, mm -hmm. the current state of technology seems to be like that, possibly, because, you know, you're dealing with smaller number of qubits. You don't, maybe you don't have like, uh, you know, great amount of resources, et cetera, and then you're bottlenecked <clears throat> in your communication processes, et cetera. 
but i really don't see that as a bottleneck as such the bottleneck would be your super luminal communications because you can't beat the speed of light <laughs> that that uh, that is the bottleneck otherwise i don't see this as a bottleneck at all as uh, you know my uh, my friends you know they they, they mentioned uh, you are you are bounded by you know you could do superposition you could do a lot of things in you know very fast it's uh, it, it's not a bottleneck but as uh, i think ankur mentioned uh, there are certain problems which are which which where in the quantum paradigm naturally fits in like for example if you're thinking about artificial intelligence and and some of these uh, type of algorithms and implementations there are if you go deep down to the level of um, devices that have to work to enable ai uh, you know memory stores and some of these these elements circuit elements naturally fit into that framework of uh, of of doing artificial intelligence so it's really the handle and lead problem how you would want to kind of see through right for so something which are actually you can do you know on classical you don't need to bring in a powerful tool because you know the real power with quantum is entanglement and for which you need these resources these bell pairs or you know multi part uh, entangled pairs and this is a resource and that resource is costly may not be today but 50 years later or 100 years later maybe people will have more efficient solutions where it will be like what we have today <laughs> but today it is a costly resource as uh, you know you, you know you have a factor of 10 power 10 off in in your efficiencies and stuff to get you know you, you need to bring those efficiencies back to realize the power uh, of of entanglement so therefore i think you cannot say it is uh, is it's, it may be slow as on today because you can't you know there you are limited by your dead times of your detectors your epr generation process etc etc dot 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 but the theory and everything is flexible that's where research has to be enabled because you need materials you need uh, that work with these systems and everything else around that infrastructure so uh, so there are it, it, it really you cannot take a binary decision saying that it is slow therefore quantum computers cannot be used or quantum communication otherwise why would the rest of the world be you know working on this if they knew that you could not do this right so so if any any others in my uh, panel ankur mrithunjoy priya if you or uh, arun is he here i think he must have left possibly i do not know so if you have uh, any uh, you know anything to add uh, feel free yeah so i hope it addresses your question okay while uh, we have lot of questions from the students uh, fraternity here uh, asking what they which are the, which is the best institute for taking phd what is their path to get into quantum compute uh, quantum information which path which institution they should take to do phd uh, what uh, line they should get in to check to get more involved in the uh, education or learn the quantum uh, quantum world right quantum information processing so i'm clubbing four so or five questions put together uh, from various okay. uh, students here so let me answer briefly and then i will let the students and the you know post docs talk about it <laughs> because they are uh, better uh, judges see i you know when it comes to institution specific uh, questions you know of course one is think globally again the best institutions uh, across the world and and also best institutions across india and of course there are no isolations as well because there are connections between institutions in india and institutions across the world and 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 you know it's, it's a we collaborate so there is really no um, you know it is it's a hard question to put and of course we look at the ratings from uh, you know uh, these um, uh, you, you know times higher education rankings or uh, your your us news rankings or uh, higher ed rankings etc etc and you get a certain impression and your you have an opinion and bias so i really this is not i mean this is of course an a, a, a routine way of of looking things but really i i don't think this is the way uh, i would look into i really go with the old school of thought you know i look at the professor who is working in these areas what what you know what's happening exciting there what new can i get from from these and this is how i would 
you know, I would make my decision for higher education. For undergraduate, it's fine. You know, you, you can just go like a herd mentality, right? Even masters, you can go with a herd mentality. But particularly with PhDs and postdocs, I think it's very specific to the professor, to the group and, and, and things, the team and stuff like that. And that's very uh, critical. And that's, uh, that's what one has to really look into. And, uh, and I would say I really like students who actually start with nothing and build things rather than something which is already there and then you just say, you know, it's available. I mean, it's, the journey is always when you when you create things. Of course, that's the reason why you get a PhD, right? So I think I will basically leave this perspective, uh, you know, talk about it from this perspective, uh, from my uh, stu- you know, postdocs and uh, from my uh, PhD students. And, and, and they would be able to tell you their perspectives as to what they think, quote unquote, uh, you know, which school is important. Of course, I as a professor would advocate IASC because I come from this institution. So therefore I would advocate IASC. So come and join IASC. Uh, I also, it's a pitamaha of, uh, you know, the Indian uh, institutions. And, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would say, you know, people, of course, we are not so well marketed uh, compared to IITs. When people, you know, this is always the situation. They say, yeah, IITs we know. And many, often many times I, I would have to intervene there and say, you know, IIT, IITs were fathered by IAC. So, and, and, and the same, and the famous names of the Raman or the Sarabhais and all these things, when you, you know, when you dot, 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 when you bring it into the list, that all came from IAC or even the ones, uh, you know, that, that are active today, you know, leading researchers. So uh, somehow it has not, you know, not been marketed to the way it should be, but people in the scientific community know very well. When they talk about Indian Institute of Science, they know about it and, 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 and you know, the contributions uh, from of IAC, you know, 110 plus years, uh, dating back even to the pre-independence time and, 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 and the mission and the goals. But uh, since it's been predominantly, uh, and it is uh, to, to you know, a very large extent, 98% is predominantly, uh, you know, graduate uh, focus, graduate level focused, you know, ma- you know, PhD, masters, PhDs, postdocs, master students, and not the undergrads. So we have not produced so many undergrads across, <laughs> or the uh, or so many, uh, you know, alumni across that you know that that have spread that kind of uh, thing forward. But a lot of lot of very high quality work has happened from Indian Institute of Science. So I would advocate, but from Indian context. And uh, there are also, of course, excellent IITs and uh, you know, faculties working in IITs, TIFR, et cetera, et cetera, leading institutions, and even local universities, Harish Chandra Institute, for example, HRI. So I would not really bias. Uh, so you have the Ashok Sains, you have uh, many people around the country. So you, you figure out, just go through the websites, you figure out uh, the individual faculties and you figure out what you like to work on. But of course, I can tell you, IAC has the um, um, has the infrastructure to catch all of you because we it's a it is multidisciplinary from you know from engineering to sciences uh, we have everything around and uh, therefore it's it you know you 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 are free to to basically work on things and this is what I would like to advocate. But of course, I would like to pass this question to the student you know to my you know PhD students who graduated and uh, Mrithun Joy uh, who is interested in, in joining ISC who would be joining ISC sometime very soon uh, who is now a postdoc with TIFR and a PhD from Cambridge he should tell his perspectives and Ankur and Priya should talk about their experiences so I will leave the floor to them right should I okay um, right I mean so th- this is a very interesting question because uh, obviously at what point and how uh, much can you engage with it um, I think for myself um, it was from my undergrad days that I was uh, you know into quantum information processing because I got a TIF for NIUS fellowship um, so as part of that I could uh, look into certain aspects so I would suggest that even at that level even at the undergrad level uh, be it within the u- university or institution or even without there are some opportunities quite a few opportunities these days uh, one should make uh, the best use of that if there internships, there are some research experiences that helps a lot, Um, uh, particularly with respect to very good uh, masters or PhD level programs as well later on, if you want to go in that direction. Uh, With regards to where a PhD can be done well, um, I mean, there are obviously lots of universities in the world. I mean, uh, in the US, um, there are quite a few universities. Cambridge has been doing quite well uh, in certain areas um, of of, of quantum information processing. Um, There are universities in India, as Professor Shayan rightly mentioned, very, very good universities, RRI, 
you know, HRI, ISC, uh, of course, uh, and uh, Australia as well. So there are lots of places. Um, but the key point here, which also Professor Sharon mentioned, is that the area within quantum information that you want to look at. Um, so obviously, there are things like mathematical um, aspects of quantum information, um, you know, the, the, uh, the foundation, so to say. Um, there, are, there are groups in ET at Zurich and various other places, even in India, uh, you will have HRI and various other places where it's very good. Uh, then you will have a realization in optical systems or other kinds of condensed matter systems where let's say EPFL in, in Europe or certain other universities will be better off, right? So there, and, and there are certain professors who are looking into those subjects within the quantum information domain. So I think it's very important to look at what particularly interests you and have a very targeted approach towards looking at the group, the professor, uh, and the work, the good work that's been done there in that group, uh, and, and move in that direction rather than just having a brand or a tag related kind of a drive, essentially, at least in the PhD level, yeah. Yeah, Priya and Ankur, you would want to also add? This? I think I think most of it was covered. Uh, I would say just uh, you know going with the passion with what the student is uh, passionate about. There's so much in the field within the field. There are subfields, and uh, one can pursue that. Uh, if one is very mathematically minded, there are so many uh, unsolved problems one can look at. One if one is interested in experiments, then uh, you know checking the lab of the professor. How is the resources there available in the lab? What kind of uh, you know implementations uh, a particular professor is looking at, and uh, yeah, so th th these theoretical and the practical aspects one can uh, you know pursue, and one mainly it's the passion actually. If one is passionate about, he he can find and he will find a place uh, where he can pursue that passion. Okay, how this our course module will help them help the students uh, identify. Uh, which path they should take it right so can we uh, match it with the module that we are that uh, the panel is uh, proposing as well yeah see i think uh, this is going to provide a, a foundation at the senior undergraduate slash introductory graduate level that's the target right i mean many topics were uh, touched upon for example you may not need so much of uh, operator algebra or representation theory etc uh, it, it, it's not also expected possibly, but but we're covering like, uh, you know, it, this would be like a foundations to quantum information processing, like part level one course, uh, which is going to be um, basics of linear algebra, probability, uh, foundations in the quantum mechanics, you know, not in, in sufficient depth, but, you know, possibly three to four hours of introduction and, and then complexity, et cetera, you know, um, some of those basics that would be like a part of module one, possibly for about uh, eight to nine hours. Then uh, it's going to get into the details of uh, quantum states, operators, uh, locality, and all of these things, which are useful. Uh, and, and, you know, th that perspective there. And when we touch upon, we'll also talk about the physical perspectives. You know, it's just not like an abstract mathematical object. And you will see the connections from physics to math and, 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 and then engineering and technology and stuff like that. So that is how this is going to be structured. And you don't have to worry about it. If you do not know what a, uh, you know, multidimensional vector is, you know, we'll, we'll start with that. And then, in, you know, with, uh, with a line of introduction, you will know immediately what it means. You can picture that in your head. So that's, that's how it's going to start. Okay. And then, um, and after that, once you understand the what what this quantum means, you know basically the language. First of all, it's a difficult thing uh, for students to understand the language. You see the notations and things like this. You, you get <clears throat> confused in your mind, <clears throat> and then it, it 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 all really boils down to basically dissecting these things and then getting that that picture. You know what is it? What is this the symbol or the, you know what is this uh, notation uh, meaning? You know physically. And once you get that clarity in your head, you will juggle through all the math yourself. You'll be able to do these things with clarity. And that's what we want to emphasize. And uh, and from there we'll get into these quantum uh, gates and circuits. And gates are fundamental. If you have to realize anything, you have to start with these gates. How do we think about it in, from a mathematical perspective? And then also, what is the physical connection? How do we realize these gates in practice? Things like these. So there'll be connections again, all the way from math to physics, math to physics, math to physics, and engineering. Right? This is going to be how it's going to be um, um, woven in um, together. Then after this, from circuits and gates, we are going to get into uh, algorithms because now you have all the foundations, and then we'll get into algorithms and uh, realizing these algorithms, how you can kind of uh, you know build build things around. 
that you can try it out possibly in your um, in your uh, quiz kits from IBM, uh, you know, or, you know, from what is provided with IBM. Or I think um, this is one thing. Second is, you know, you should not think about uh, what we are on today. Like, uh, you know, yeah, I, I have some programming language available or some platform available. I'm going to do this. That that gives you one feel. But above and beyond, it should motivate for you to think about deeper problems that you have to, this is a vision that you have a high level vision. You want to bring the quantum internet or the quantum computer with all and or quantum memories and stuff like that. You know, that's a dream. How do we get to those dreams starting from scratch? And this is how uh, it would motivate. So don't expect that within a year, you're going to get a job, but it's going to happen very soon <laughs> because I think it's going to be, you know, when things pick up, uh, right? I think it really pick up, picks up momentum. And I, I don't think uh, people should be lost out uh, because they don't understand uh, what's happening right and this is how we would like to sort of pitch in so priya do you want to add anything to it i didn't think i don't think you spoke about uh... uh yeah i would want to say like very similar things to what you said but i would also encourage people to go and speak to the professors like whom you would want to work with so that you can get if get to know if you're really interested in that area and if you are aligned to the professor like even professor shan he encourages that. So before the PhD interviews and even before applying, you can go and speak to the professor and get to know what exactly the professor is working on and whether you're interested in that area. So in PhD, interest matters more than how much you really know at the start of your PhD because even for me, like I hardly knew anything about quantum systems in the start. But once I was at IASC, I could pick up things and I could learn it because I had the interest in these areas. So that's something which I would take there. Sure. So the next question that uh, that's very interesting is uh, people talking about how this is very interesting field and uh, uh, what do you think enough jobs will be available in the next two years? Good question. Yeah. Right. Okay. So here is what I would. Uh, okay. I, I, it, it goes to my, I think, uh, first slide, I think, when I talk about the synergy between academic research, industrial R&D, society and governance and all that. So you have to start somewhere from scratch. So where do you start, right? So this is where it, it starts with academic research. And then now you have something to, to, to start with. And now, from a business perspective, you want to show an order of imp improvement. For example, when you talk about... Um, let us say communication uh, using uh, you know quantum than without it you should be able to tell you are able to get remarkable throughputs than what you have as on today so for for you to get remarkable throughputs like you know like, like if you think about a fiber optic cable i will let me tell you you may get you know a gig plus or maybe tens of gig possibly right under in under very high snr conditions but uh, now, if you want to better that, you have this technology here with quantum that you could potentially do or very high precision instrumentation, right? That you want to measure something that beyond PICO or FEMTO, something like that, which, you know, today's instruments, you don't have that kind of precision instrumentation, right? So uh, imagine a photon, one photon, you know, you know, E equals H mu, right? Do your Planck's constant, do your frequency, multiply them, you know what order that energy is. That sort of, that hits and there's a, there's a change in your... Uh, in your resistance or whatever, and you're you're interested in bringing the you know this these magnetometers or this uh, precision instrumentation, this may have profound applications. So once you show there is some some technology, you have to build on top of it, and uh, so I think that is how I would start. Um, uh, um, that that's how I would start. Uh, for example, I'll tell you a perspectives from uh, magnetic storage. Um, the in the 1970s, even 60s and 70s, they had this huge bulky analog uh, equalizers and stuff where you could really see the magnetic grains like this, literally, and you could basically tune the the equalizer and you could really control what you could store. You know, huge bulky things that you could store one or one or zero on the on that grain that you could see through what it is. It was it was something like that. Uh, maybe you know even more than a milli scale, but things have evolved from there. Today we are at nanometer scales that you can't. Nothing is just all within a small SD card that 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 is where all your information is, uh, holding terabits of information. And quantum has that potential, even below uh, below that. So the job creation process has to be 
evolutionary from research technologies once there is some progress you build technology and show that it is possible but for that you have to show that there is some order of uh, magnitude improvement I, i i think this is all possible with 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 quantum from precision instrumentation um, uh, quantum computing i mean two i think uh, yeah a lot of problems can be because the quantum um, uh, you know this quantum advantage a lot of these companies were able to demonstrate right google had some interesting demonstrations so i think you should look through all those and i think this is going to pretty much pave the way but uh, you may ask these questions like can we get it at room temperatures uh, temperatures and stuff like that that may not be immediate uh, you know superconductivity at room temperatures and stuff like this these are grand challenges it may happen not today but some years down the lane uh, when the, you know as as things evolve and any new research that you see solving the problem uh, that is persistent today that creates a business opportunity and when there, when there is a business opportunity it opens up employment dot 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 this is how i would see things uh thanks prof so the next question that is there is uh, there are a lot of courses available through edx udemy and ibm is providing their own courses now through coding school summer school etc so how that is different from the modules that we are presenting in the uh, uh, or uh, you are going to propose these four modules how those are different from them okay Uh, good question so this is going to be uh, you know i think individual centric than just a mass uh, something that you could see for example in np inptel also because of uh, you know some certain constraints on the number of students here i think we would like to even target large number of students 100 plus possibly is a cap like you know we can't take more than 200 or something like that but we would like all these people to come on board and i think depth and breadth or what would what we would focus upon with individual attention to the details that the student has to pick up and strongly we will encourage projects in the courses and uh, i think uh, you know teaming up or doing individually uh, you know we encourage projects and uh, i think right now we are limited in terms of just being able to do this in terms of uh, software and trying these algorithms and things things out is since it's also a foundational course um hardware is what we really i think that would be a game changer for all the courses and i really would like to see this not today uh, but i think my dream is in 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 two years from today that you know if if if, if we are going to pitch it right we will say that yeah please try this on this piece of hardware two to three years from today yeah so uh, in that sense it's going to be different and we want people to get that hands on experience um, and individual attention to do, towards doing things and that's why we have a team of five people and um, and and a structured way of of approaching this thing uh, and uh, i mean it's not like immediately you're going to build a quantum computer or immediately you're going to launch a, a magnetometer and you're going to it, it's not possible right it's uh, it's it's not possible let me put it honestly and even those that are working in the ai area for example i tell them come on can you build the next neuromorphic processor immediately build you know you know building all these memristors and replace them instead of transistors or silicon device you know normal cmos kind of stuff i don't think that's uh, that's that, that that's going to happen uh, so don't have such expectations but at least if you dream of such expectations dream of such things this is where you're going to start to get to that ladder and and that's what we want to pitch in and that way uh, and since it is individual focused uh, it is going to be different from the mass uh, coursera or something like that so we we are not going to take too many people but not too less people so we we admit uh, up to a bandwidth of about 200 people that you know we would we would like to cater to all of you okay there is question like uh, is there any possibility to conduct experiments in the colleges in india that is what is required <laughs> that is what is really required and that uh, that mantra should just go out i am telling you know i, I, I have been vocal about it for quite some time now and i think uh, i myself should start Uh, my hands you know in the classical side is and i'm i've been in the quantum theory side in the classical side we also do the uh, the experimental part with uh, with fpga circuits and so on but yes a uh, quantum side you really need to do the experiments like the way one built oscillators amplifiers uh, and things like this in electronic side uh, this is where we have to start. 
but it's a, it's again a very vast field photonics is one vertical you know superconducting is in another side nv centers is another side you can't be a master of everything is impossible my personal interest would be in the in the area of photonics and i see some promise there that what i would like to do and engage myself in that and and my team as well uh, but i think you should go you have to start from somewhere i mean the, you know otherwise it's going to be inertial state right can clap your hands like this uh, you know if from ampere's law to uh, from ampere or you know whatever it is you know they they did these experiments or the you know the electric bulb you know whatever that uh, edison had to do to get things right this is the state where we have to do things but of course we are sort of well cushioned uh, thinking about our just our computers and coding and because we are used to it you know now even a kid Uh, you know, seven-year-old knows what a software code is. <laughs> they would have possibly seen the compile of a C code, "Hello World," and they can see the output. That that is that is you know that is not uh, what I think we should do. We should really set up experiments, for which I think this has to go like uh, like a revolution. Uh, you have everybody should do should do get to do things. But I, of course, this is a niche area. Not it's not easy to enter. just like that uh, even for some of us who are seasoned in these things and uh, you know who've seen through the evolution of some of these areas it takes a lot of knowledge and 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 uh, and then basically a, a certain leap of faith to enter um, and and be successful at it so it's uh, it's not like writing this piece of code and compiling hello world certainly not not that uh, it's a very specialized thing but yes it should start in everywhere and i don't see much of photonics all over india and uh, interestingly uh, you know uh, the nobel in physics from india is from raman <laughs> who is very well known and famous for um, the raman effect and uh, somehow i have not seen that that take off uh, so much in a big time that should be uh, basically india should have been a leader in the area of photonics you know in everything and uh, so it's uh, you know yeah in general yes i think around the world you need experiments along with so solid adding clearing to, adding to the same question is the is will there be any simulators be created or for testing and understanding the concepts so if there is any oh, there are already very good question see for example i know uh, in nic professor apurva patel uh, is thinking about you know he already has some some uh, simulator uh, setups that he's thinking about uh, you know he he already has that people are working on these and developing these simulators to exercise a piece of code software etc so you should write an email to professor apurva patel from uh, physics department uh, he's uh, with uh, you know you, you can go do a google search you know you, you can get get the information or let me know uh, so he's uh, working on the simulators and stuff like this um so to realize algorithms and how you could speed them up etc etc because still you're using the the classical objects for these things really the game changer is when you have a quantum hardware a quantum ram or a quantum dot 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 whatever that you see a quantum computer with quantum ingredients and then sitting on it is a quantum code that you would compile and and run on that beast that is where we want but yes you could try the simulators uh, quantum simulators that still work on uh, classical platforms i hope it addresses your question yeah the next but really we need hardware this is this is really the thing key yeah yeah so the next question is uh, is there any cost associated with the course and when it will be available from when the uh, modules will be uh, available so i think my vision is that this would basically come through um, iisc center for continuing education cce because that's the only way that's the only outlet it has to go through otherwise uh, and unless there is a paradigm shift in the way we think uh, you know with a new education policy i do not know what can happen or what the government has its vision i mean i can't read their mind um, so uh, not at least entangled <laughs> to what they see uh, so uh, so therefore this has to go through the cc's uh, umbrella is what i think and the cc has the policy uh, it is uh, 5000 rupees per credit so which is going to be 15000 um, rupees uh, for three credits and the one credit is roughly 10 hours so it's going to be uh, a 30 hour course would cost 15000 
uh, but I think it would be self-contained where the videos are available for the course participants, the course nodes carefully compiled would be available to all the participants it, and, and, um, and that is how uh, we, we, this is going to be, uh, this is hopefully going to be launched. And it is, uh, and of course you may, you may ask NPTEL because it's not going to be launched immediately at, at, through NPTEL, but it can happen um, as a next step. Uh, where it could be, it, it can be launched uh, through NPTEL, and uh, but I think one uh, one thing that you should note is with um, with these type of courses, specialized courses through CC, through ISC, etc. Uh, there is a cap on the number of students. Unlike NPTEL, NPTEL, ten thousand students can take a course and the computer can grade the assignments and uh, you know your exams within no time <laughs> and, and, and provide you a grade. But here, I don't think we are going to go in that mode because it is humanly impossible to uh, you know, pay individual attention if you go in mass. So there would be a cap, no more than like 200 students, but there would be very carefully crafted homeworks, assignments, et cetera, et cetera, and very individual focused that we would like to take uh, so that we want people to get on board and we want to save them uh, together with us so uh, so that they're not lost. So uh, therefore that is the, uh, and, and to come up with these materials, sitting down and getting all these things done, there is a cost associated with it. And uh, I think that is something which uh, I, would, I think I would like to make a mention here, yeah. But uh, I do not know exact figures. I think these, these are the figures you can check with C C C figures. And I think it is, comp uh, Okay, uh, with this, I would like to conclude here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Cheyenne and uh, the panel members, uh, Priya, Ankur, Mithunjoy, and uh, so uh, this, this brings us to the end of the session. If you have any other questions, you can always drop it, uh, drop it to us. You can, uh, we can, we can talk about it. We can pass on your questions to the professors and uh, uh, feel free to provide your comments uh, and uh, as well as any feedback to us directly. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. And um, you know, it was great to be part of this uh, session. And uh, we thought it'd be done soon, but you know, you engaged exactly for two hours and, and, and you, know, you, you know your business, so. <laughs> so I, I, you know, your uh, value for time. So uh, it, it was a pleasure uh, being here with my team. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. The videos will be sent to you over email, and uh, right now it's on YouTube as well. You guys can check it out.